Welcome to session number, I don't know, two or three or four, uh, Making Sense Online. Chatting here with my good buddy, Dave Cormier. Dave, how's your day? It's been an amazing day. The sun's come out. It's uh, 15 degrees out there, and I worked from outside all day, so it's been, uh, it's been really nice. For those Americans in our midst, 15 degrees is something probably a little bit closer to about 60. And uh, so that means, for a Canadian, that means it's really nice. Uh, especially Summer, in spring. basically. Yeah, basically, this is one of the top five days of the year. So uh, why don't we dive into a few random chats that we got going on here. Uh, one of the things I found interesting uh, is the difficulties that we're seeing with the way that COVID is impacting the academy. So let's look at this, Dave. Where in society do we have more people who are, say, over 50 to 60 and still actively working than in higher education? There's not many sectors that have that. And Rock music? <laughs> that's true. Keith Richards, protect him at all costs. <laughs> um, Just saying. But, but so I was reading this today, and I'm going to drop this link in here, which is the, you know, what's happening in, uh, you know, in the academy from scholars who are, uh, who COVID uh, has taken their toll and mentioned for prominent academics that have died from COVID-19 over the last, uh, the last month. And so I, I was thinking, instead of a recent faculty meeting, when you, you look around and, you know, 50, 60% of your faculty are, are uh, 60 plus. So uh, wh what do you do with that? Because it's going to have an enormous knowledge drain on the institution if it continues to sweep. I don't, it's not only a knowledge drain, but as you go forward, um, when the second phase and third phase of this goes through, um, they're not going to be able to go back to work. Right. So like there's going to be a phased approach going back because there's no way we're just all going to one day go, hey, we're all done. Let's go back to work. It's going to be a phased approach. We're not going to have big classes. We'll only be doing small lecture classes or, or however that goes. Labs are a big one that will probably roll in first. Um, but those people who are at high risk, well, then clearly we're not going to want them to go back first. So I think there's this also this delaying factor. And I think it's going to contribute. I say think. I think it should contribute to a restructuring of the way that we do higher ed anyway. Um, because we're going to have to leave those people uh, out of the face-to-face -face encounters at first. And then maybe that will contribute to us to using their experience for something different than um, teaching first-year classes. Maybe that gets all rearranged. I don't know. Okay, this came up, you, you raised this last time, which is you're like, there's going to be a completely significant restructuring of the universities come fall or come the next year or two. And that's being borne out in the US. If you look at the number of private colleges that rely exclusively on tuition, they don't have a deep set of uh, alumni dollars. They don't have uh, a huge pocket of money set aside. In many cases, they don't have the resources of the state to fall back on. That'll backfill. And, and in the last 10 years, they've had 20 to 30% of their budgets from what they do get from the state taken away from them. So yeah. there's no cushion. Yep. No cushion. And that's, that's the, in so many of the conversations about higher ed, one of the things that I find so frustrating is that the top sort of 5% of the universities are the people who get called to comment and get interviewed. And we have this sort of disproportionate view of higher education with a billion dollars of endowment, right? Or higher education with a hundred percent enrollment of however many they want to enroll, you know, people who turn away 95% of the people who apply, whereas the vast majority of the higher education, the vast majority of it, are not like that. They are people who are have uh, spent the last 10 years trimming their budgets, right? As we've come thinner and thinner and thinner through that process, have um, increasingly relied on adjuncts and um, part-time labor to fulfill a lot of their higher education, a lot of their teaching roles, and have a very there's this weird top-heavy thing that happens in higher education where you end up with somebody who gets paid three thousand dollars a year, three thousand dollars a course and somebody who gets paid $50,000 a course, right? Or $100,000 a course in some cases to teach. And it's just not a sustainable model. And as the pressure increases on it, more and more universities are just gonna throw their hands up in the air. Um, well, the difficulty with that, I mean, it's not just that, you know, you're getting paid 50 or 100,000 to teach as a, you know, a tenured faculty member, at least in, in the U.S. or the Western context. I mean, you're expected to research, you're expected to do service. Uh, you know, very few faculty, even those tenure track work 40 hours a week. 
there, there is a, a significant uh, time commitment that goes well beyond. So the, the 50,000, of course, no. is not, it's not no, 50,000, no. of course. It, it, it is in your world, George. It is in this sort of high flying, I'm a fancy guy world. But there are an awful lot of faculty who don't research, who occasionally publish, right? Who sometimes research and are still paid at that range, right? So the people who end out at conferences and stuff like that are totally those kinds of people. But at, you know, when you get inside of an institution, you look at those 500 faculty and you look at the number of publications they have, that bottom half does not have a lot of publications. They're no, not doing a, a lot of research. Which is, which is one of the issues that a number of systems have come up, such as UK and Australia has done something yeah. comparable. It's less pronounced in Canada and US, but they've yeah. said, you know what, um, this, uh, you, you can't just be an academic and, and get all the perks of being an academic, but not publish in top tiers. You're publishing in these remote uh, you know, journals that nobody's really aware of. So from that end, okay, I get it. That's a fair case to make. Not everybody works at that level by the same account. Now may not be the time to suddenly hold everybody to, you know, to, to revise the whole system. But let's go back to the fact that universities have a lot of people who fit into the high risk profile for COVID. Yes. That's going to have an interesting impact because even though in this, this, the inside higher ed article I dropped in that that's, they're just describing it. Hey, you've got, uh, you know, four that have been identified, but you look at if, if the, the rates are as impactful as they, as we hear that they are, especially for older people, you're going to see a, a really significant impact on higher education and the, the faculty in particular in terms of death rates. I just wanted to start on a happy note. We haven't talked about that a lot, but that's, we have an age problem and maybe an age problem is not the right word, but we have a higher average age in higher education than we do in a lot of other sectors of society. That's true. Um, but what, like, that's certainly going to impact the way that people get, like, I mean, to me, you're just going to end up with more sessionals hired to fill in those courses. I mean, obviously it's terrible that people get sick and I, I'm sorry for the process that they're going through, but I mean, isn't that just going to further the current trends? Uh, well, I mean, let's face it, faculty are not always replaced when they retire now. A lot of faculty hires or positions are going to remain closed, which reminds me, I'm going to drop this other link in here. Um, I told you this before, but it was uh, the, the impact that this is going to have on higher education employment is underappreciated right now for how dramatic it will be. So in this case, it's basically colleges and others are saying we're, we're stopping all hiring. We're freezing all hiring. We're even withdrawing verbal offers. And if you're a postdoc or a you know, recent doctoral student that's now moving into postdoc, you're, you're not in a good place because the job market is falling out from underneath you. So we're going to have an interesting problem, which is going to be solved through adjunct work not through hiring new staff, not through people who say are older that decide to retire um, or, you know, heaven forbid, it gets to be a significant enough uh, challenge where you're going to see a growing amount of faculty or staff profs that, that uh, die as a result of exposure to COVID. It's, it's going to be a changed uh, higher education labor market that is driven partly by coronavirus, but as much driven by the fact that people are uh, getting a rethinking of the university system. And I, I'm gonna throw in two more cross sections there and that's the change in research spending and that piece that just came up on Times Higher Ed today about um, the new global network coordination for climate change. So we've been fighting towards a more interdisciplinary and more inter-university, particularly like Ontario wants Ontario universities to work together, Canadian, Canada wants Canadian universities to work together, sort of approach for, what do you say, 15, 20 years now? You would know better than I would. Um, but one of the, the, the higher end outcomes of this whole process is suddenly everybody's going to learn how to collaborate online. Um, yeah. And because they're gonna be forced to, right? Yeah. And yeah. so if these researchers who aren't allowed to go back to the classroom anymore are at home, and like some of the researchers I was talking to who are desperate to get their research done and realizing they're gonna have to go back to ethics and rewrite their applications and redo their research um is that going to provide a boon that's going to counterbalance the other piece i i don't know i don't think so i mean i don't think we're going to see uh let's try let me try to be briefly negative but i i think we are going to see parts of the university sector so irreversibly impacted 
there are going to be schools that will need to be closed because the state level budgets, just put in a context. So last week, the US had something like 3 million new unemployment claims, which absolutely shattered, like shattered any previous record. If you look at a chart of it, it's like previous, uh, you know, since going back to the 1950s, you've got these small little things, uh, you know, blips in, in unemployment uh, that happens at the start of a recession. I think the previous record was like a few hundred thousand. Uh, per week. It might have been as high as six or 700,000. Last week or two weeks ago, we hit 3 million in the U.S. for new unemployment claims. It absolutely eclipsed anything that had ever happened before. This week, today, it was announced 6 million, which means it doubled the previous ridiculous record that was being set. The impact of that, we talked about this when we chatted on Tuesday, this financial flow is going to hit universities next year. Many of us have budgets set this year, so we're going to be kind of okay. But next year, it, so I, I expect there will be universities that literally will furlough all staff that will end up saying, you got no money for this next semester, you're shut down. The federal government in the U.S. is very actively you know, pumping cash into the economy, but you can, you can only do so many. We're going to see a convergence of the impact of COVID, the healthcare crisis. We're going to see what can only be described as a Great Depression in terms of the, the economic impact. And we're simultaneously at the very early stages of a housing market, revisiting the 2008 housing market crash that we saw. So I'm just saying you bring all of these together, it changes everything we know about tenure. It changes everything we know about how universities operate. Uh, it, it changes the entire model. And the early stage, the canary in a coal mine thing I was just sharing is the fact that they're pausing all hiring, which is extremely unusual in higher education. I don't even think that happened at this degree in 2008. And we are still, as I said to a meeting earlier, if this is a day, we haven't even had breakfast yet in COVID. Like we're still waking up. And so okay. it's going to, yeah, that was my to add, thought for the day. To, the, to add to that cheer, um, I'm not even sure that your this year's budget is protected because that's a custom. And customs have a funny habit of going away whenever there's no money in the coffers. Because while that money is there, a lot of it is projected funds, right? And if those projected funds get huge cuts in them, that money might not even be there when you get there, right? Like you may get that phone call that goes, yeah, no, you don't have that anymore. And now you're going to have to cut 25% of whatever, right? And yeah, the other happy part, the other happy thought is if all these people are on unemployment, what is the decision they make for this year's cycle, even if it's only a temporary blip in the way that people look at universities? If 10% of people, who we're going to go to you in, in first year next year decide to wait a year just a year what's that going to do to the to the bottom line of higher education well it's going to have a colossal impact and it could be more than 10 it could be 50. well see and on a positive note often what happens in these economic crises is that there's a return to university you're like i, I don't have a job i don't have a you know, an opportunity to, to uh, you know, enter the labor market right now, or my job category is basically obliterated, I might as well go to university. Um, I think the winners in this, and I see this just by virtue of who is the most aggressively advertising, it's going to be the MOOC players, I think, because Coursera is busy pushing data science masters, edX, same thing, data science, comp sci masters. Uh, I think they're going to, and now keep in mind, those, they generally flow their student population to universities. They're not like Udacity that keeps the students themselves. They're like, take a few courses with us now, you know, on edX now, go take a master's with this university. So for example, we have at, at UTA come fall, we have a master of science and learning analytics that's expected to be launched pending final state approval. Um, those are the kinds of things where students will have an opportunity to go into because it's fully online. But, th so, but those are students who are already in there, who are already educated, who are already on that track. Nobody who is unemployed right now, who is thinking I need to reskill, is thinking, yeah, you know what I need a data science master's. I and think plus, they will though. I think plus they you're will. only looking you're only looking at twenty or thirty thousand people who are gonna be yeah, doing that. If if I was in any any profession right now, if I was to if I could wave a magic wand and want to go to the most successful space right now, I'd be moving to a community college, because I think what ends up happening in times of crisis, and I do believe we saw this in two thousand eight, is we see a shift towards things that are far more attached to the actual job that's that they're going to get as a result of that. So we've been arguing for years that the overall economy ends up being strengthened if people go to university and your own earning power ends up being strengthened, just not over the short term. But in times of crisis, 
everybody's like, yeah, short term, short term. I can go back later if I really need to. What I need right now is to learn how to swing a hammer. Although at the same time, those jobs aren't what they were either. But the actual jobs information is from last year, which is what people are going to be making their decisions on only to find out that we end up with way more people for one profession than another. This is what worries me is that none of the data and none of the projections that we have for this year applies to this year. Well, nothing that we know applies, like nothing that we know about the economy applies to this situation. I mean, you've got guys that are, you know, you know, people like Warren Buffett who are well-versed. He knows a thing or two about the markets, that fella. And yeah. he's coming out and he's saying, I've been alive for 89 years and this is a cluster. I ain't never seen nothing like this. I'm not Did sure why he talk speaks like with a southern draw. Why does he talk like that? Uh, he's, from, he's from Omaha, man. That's how they all speak in Omaha. I wish you knew your American geography better, Dave. So, I wish I did. So flip side to your hammer argument, right? They need to swing a hammer. Agree. A lot of people want practical work. And yes, computer science though, and data science and related fields. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of forecast jobs in that, even though none of that may be applicable anymore. The difference is those kinds of courses you can take online. You can start yes. taking courses. Yep. You, you still need to physically be present. So that'll be another factor. But I want to bring something else in, and that is the decision by the University of California system to suspend all um, typical SAT, ACT requirements. So we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we're like, we had an individual that was that said, you know what, I can't get into graduate school because my tests aren't, I can't take my test to get into graduate school. So I don't know if I'll be able to go to school. Now, universities are very good at wanting to earn money. And one way to earn money is to admit students. Yes, it's a very so, successful path. Yeah. It's, it's, they figured this out early on back in 1488. <laughs> no, but so they admit students. So now they're saying, well, look, these standardized testing and these, these approaches to get students in is a significant issue. Uh, we're just going to drop it. Now, they're saying right now, this is a one-year change. What do you think of that? Whatever. I mean... The, oh, what's the name of that? The, the American, it's college. What are they called? The guys who run the tests. The, the, they do the AP testing. They do all that stuff. Yeah. I, mean, the organ, I know. The organ, yeah. I forget what they're called. But I mean, they've been a thorn for years. They do whatever they want. They control the process. I mean, they're, they're the only people who might be worse than paid academic publishers who are withholding information that's paid for by the public. Like, I, I think it'd be fantastic to get the guns out of the process. And would, why wouldn't you? Does it actually help to know what someone's SAT score is when everybody's gaming the system of SAT scores anyway? I mean, the whole thing, the most important thing in recruitment, and again, outside of MIT and Harvard, whatever else, the most important thing you need to know, uh, at least in the, in the seven or eight years I did first year, I worked with first year students, is do you want to be here? And do you care? And those are the two things you need to know for a student for them to persist. And the SAT score does nothing to tell you anything about that. So, so what do you think of this in terms of longer term impact? Because clearly when you have in the U.S. hundreds of thousands of students who are likely not doing some level of testing this year to get admitted into university. Yep. Um, do you think they're suddenly in 20, they're saying for 2021, this is how they're going to change it. Do you think for 2022, they're suddenly going to be like, oh yeah, let's go back to that testing there's no that way. we used to do. There's no, no, there's no way. You're, there's you're no thinking way. this is a massive blow. I, I would love to see it go. And it just, I mean, I hate standardized testing anyway, so I'm biased to begin with. You're but an angry man, Dave. I am an angry man. Um, I think that that's a one-way trip. And the University of California system is gigantic. Yeah, um, exactly. It's like when they went to bat with, with Elsevier, um, and, and you know, they're big enough to change the conversations. I think so and too. what they do has the prospect to flow into other systems quite quickly. Yeah, because why would you, like, if you're having to go through those, it's, it's not like anybody admits them on SAT scores alone, mm. right? So they're looking through yeah. high school grades or whatever else. It has to filter through something, even if that's done dynamically in the back end by some magical AI system. There are still other data points there anyway. And the SAT score, like, that's awesome. I mean, anyway, I'll leave it there. I ranted enough already. Yeah, you're, you're genuinely excited at the prospect. I am genuinely excited about the prospect. Because again, I think, see, you got me going again. All of these, if you, if you look at the system of higher ed through the lens of the parent who wants their kids to be a kid to be a doctor, 
right? There is the SAT score, there is the, the medical application score, uh, test, and then there's the test at the end that gets you into your specialty. Like there's all those systems along the way, right? They're all test-based. And at the end, of the, the drive for anybody who wants to get through this process is to mechanically push yourself towards a complicated approach to the world. That's the thing that's gonna get you through these testing systems. Those are not the professionals we actually wanna have coming out the other end. We want professionals who are able to deal with complexity, like say now. Um, and I would love to see that this, the inability of us to do uh, proctored online testing, which seems like a technical issue, but I think in reality has a chance of becoming a cultural shift. Because if you can't do proctored testing anymore, because for a year and a half, let's say, what the, the systems that we put into place have the potential, like getting rid of the SAT scores, to be something that persists through this process. Well, I think Jim adds a good question there as well. You know, and uh, sorry to tee you up for ranting against uh, traditional testing and the accuracy of what it measures. Jim's asking, what about if you drop these requirements, is it gonna make admissions more equitable? Or are minor minorities still going to be uh, sort of on the outs? What do you think, George? I'm asking you, Dave. I'm the asker of questions. Is that what you are? I'm I the one who asks. That. Well, it's just because I started first today. Whoever asks the first couple of questions gets to be the question asker for the rest of the, the discussion. Is that how that works? Um, it is written. I think it certainly has the potential to apply different policies inside an organization. Right now, if you've got an external test that you can use as an excuse to not do your job, I'm not speaking directly about any recruitment people in particular, but if you can use it as an excuse, well, look at the SAT score, this person's never gonna be able to succeed. Um, and that SAT score is tied to socioeconomic status, which we all know that it is, um, then you know it brings us back to that chance of um, parts of higher ed to be actually about widening participation where you can apply a policy to a department and say, we're going to be more equitable in our, in our recruitment process. And then they're not going to be able to use the SAT as a get out of jail free card for being able to follow whatever racist policies that are embedded in their own systems. Um, so I think it's a really exciting prospect. I don't know if that answers your question, Jim, if I'm just ranting at you now. He's like, you've ranted near me before, Dave. I know that look on your face. I think, <laughs> yeah. Well, so here's a final point. We've got a couple minutes left here. I just want to dive into I. The, something that we've chatted about several times, it's the equity and it's the access component of this because we are dealing with something in terms of assumptions. I had a discussion just prior to this uh, with, with you know someone, a uh, journalist that was asking about what's the impact that this has on, on a number of, of different aspects of the university sector and the student population. Like everything that you and I take for granted, we sit down, connect to a network that has Wi-Fi, have, you know, broadband-ish capability, a laptop that's likely been purchased in the last two or three years. It has a camera. We might have funky microphones. We might whatever. But all of these things that we just sit down and start connecting and communicating with people from around the world, potentially, every single one of those has a dollar sign behind it. And if you come from a certain background, you may not have access to any of those things. So the one resource that Justin had shared earlier was this uh, article from the, the Texas uh, Tribune, which said that a significant percentage, a third of states represent, or residents in Texas do not have broadband capability at home. That's a third, meaning they probably can't do video and they probably, they may even have difficulty with audio and the list goes on. So this is very much a critical economic and social concern, especially we're going to be here for months to years. Well, you add digital proctoring to that process, right? And now suddenly we've got a whole bunch of people who are going to fail their tests uh, because they can't keep Zoom running while they're actually having someone spy on them while they're trying to fill out a multiple choice test. Um, putting aside the awful thing that does to us as people, whenever we feel the need to watch people all the time, um, it will definitely disadvantage those people. There will be people doing their exams on their phones. There's going to be people, you know, sitting in the McDonald's parking lot to use the Wi-Fi. Like that's the kind of th stuff that's going to be happening. You can't tell me that's not a disadvantage. Um, but I mean, we're finding, I, I, 
any number of people that I know in the industry who have talked to faculty who are like, no, no, that's okay. We're weeding those people out. Like, I still think that there's a lot of people inside of our industry who really see their job as getting rid of the person to your right, the person to your left. And that sort of look to the person to your right, person to your left, you're not, you're going to see that those people don't graduate with you. I think there's still a lot of people in higher ed who actually literally see our job to filter the people out who don't deserve to be there. You know, I thought I was grumpy today, Dave, but man, you're bringing, <laughs> you're bringing all the grump today. Um, yeah, I, 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 but I do agree with, with the, with what the challenge is that, that uh, exist and that in many cases, a crisis just surfaces a lot of in existing equalities. It doesn't necessarily create them, but it sure highlights them. And we're yeah. sure seeing an awful lot of them unfolding now uh, in, in uh, the university sector and, and how it's treating people who are from a economically disadvantaged position, how it's treating people who perhaps uh, aren't familiar with navigating the university situation. They may be first in family, the immigrant population. There's all kinds of factors at play that we're vastly underprepared to accommodate. But this is the first step of change, George, before he shut us down. If we, if we see it, if it surfaces it, and we face it and talk about it and give it a name, it gives us a chance to actually fix it. I, mean, I really think it's a really exciting time for higher ed right now. It, you'll never have a sort of a lever of change as pronounced as the one we have right now. Um, Couldn't agree more. Good or bad. But, and something, and I need to end on this note because I like to have the last word. In the <laughs> academy, we don't have avenues for change like this very often. And, but there's a lot of very motivated players, often in the startup and for-profit community that see the exact same thing we, have, we see and are going to be chomping at the bit aggressively. You know, I've been receiving emails on use our products, do this, do that for for the last couple of weeks. So it's definitely been a growing interest. Dave, good to chat. You get to be the asker on Tuesday. I, that's great. George, I hope your new MOOC company is going well. I heard from Australia that, uh, <laughs> that you just started that awesome. and I hope you're really successful with it. That's my favorite thing. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate that. Cheers. Take care.